بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين المصطفى أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا الله صلى الله عليه محمد وآله واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقرآنه الحميد وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام را كتاب أنزلناه إليك لتخرج الناس من الظلمات إلى النور بإذن ربهم إلى صراط العزيز الحميد الله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وويل للكافرين من عذاب شديد الذين يستحبون الحياة الدنيا على الآخرة ويصدون عن سبيل الله ويبغونها عوجا أولئك في ضلال بعيد وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ فَيُضِلُّ اللَّهُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ صدق الله العلي العظيم Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. We are going to continue tonight, inshaAllah, our discussion about the tafsir of Surah Ibrahim ala nabiyyina wa alihi wa alayhi salam. We discussed ayah number one, where we said that the first beginning or part of the ayah, alif lam ra, these alphabets, they have certain interpretations. We provided four interpretations. Of this uh, of these uh, letters and then we said that Allah says about the Holy Quran kitabun anzalnahu ilayka it's a book that we have revealed to you لتخرج الناس من الظلمات إلى النور so that you take people people from darknesses to the light and we said that how the Quran is really for humanity at large Moreover, Allah is saying that you take this book as a book of guidance to guide people, take them out from darknesses and to light. Religion gives people light, nur. It gives them life as well. It makes them alive. And Allah says in the last ayah of Surah Ibrahim, هَذَا بَلَاغُ nas. This is a proclamation for humankind. And in the beginning, أَنزَلْنَاهُ إِلَيْكَ لِتُخْرِجَ nas. So again, Allah is talking to humanity here. He wants to guide people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the creation to guide them, to take them to Jannah. Allah loves his creation. Allah billah is not this deity who is just waiting to punish the people and throw them into the hellfire. Billah. Rather, he is so merciful, so loving, so kind, so compassionate. He wants any excuse for the person to enter into Jannah. It is narrated that on the day of judgment, a person who may have been a believer, but he may have had lots of sins. Because on the day of judgment, there will be some individuals who, for example, will go straight to Jannah. There will be individuals, for example, who will... Um, take a little bit longer to get to Jannah and that would be enough to pay their dues for example let's say to have justice and so on so forth some people 
need to be scared. You know, we'll have to have a scare, like the angels dragging them to Jahannam and that fear, whatever, that then washes off their remaining sins. Some people will, billah, will enter into Jahannam, will actually get into the fire, spend some time in there in transit until they leave it and go to Jannah. So it varies. But out of the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is said that there will be a person whom Allah will say to the angels, take him to the hellfire. So the angels will, came, will come, uh, chain him and start dragging him to the hellfire. Well, billah, this person, as he's being dragged, he will turn around. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell the angels, stop. He says, my servant, why did you look back? Now, of course, Allah is not in a physical place, but rather there is a voice that Allah creates. So this person takes back to the place where the voice is coming from. Not that Allah is there. You know, Allah is not a person. He is not confined in space or time. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says in the Quran, Laysa kamitlihi shay. There is nothing like him. Okay. But Allah creates a voice just like He created a voice that spoke to Musa alayhi salam. And hence Musa became known as Kalimullah, the one whom Allah spoke to. All right. So this person turns. Allah will tell him, Why did you turn? He said, Because my Lord, I am unworthy, but I believe that you are worthy. So I was expecting you would forgive me for my shortcomings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell the angels, my servant is not telling the truth. When he was in dunya, he was not expecting me to forgive him and well, he was doing whatever he likes. He was enjoying his life. However, now that he said this, Forgive him. Khalas. Let him go to Jannah. Basically, what may be understood from this is that this individual was a believer. Otherwise, that would not have happened. If he were not a believer, if he were not a person who used to do his salat and, and really take care of himself, that would not have happened. But this person apparently is a believer. And, of course, God knows best. Uh... But then he still had sin. So that scare of being dragged to the hellfire and whatever was enough to wash off his remaining sins. But you see the rahmah of Allah. Even though this person is, is lying, he's not telling the truth. And Allah knows he's lying. He's not telling the truth. But because he turned back and that turned back, he was hoping for Allah's mercy. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers his hope does not let him go it says take him to jannah so you see how loving is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really brothers and sisters we should think about our actions and start really reflecting how can i really submit to allah whenever we make a mistake we do istighfar astaghfirullah there was a so-called alim at the time of amir al-mu'mineen and then he lived through the time until Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam and even after. And his name was al-Hasan al-Basri. They came to Imam al-Sajjad one day, some people, and they told him, al-Hasan al-Basri says, I am not surprised at the one who perishes, how he perishes. I mean, those who end up in Jahannam, I'm not surprised how they end up in Jahannam because of all the desires, the temptations, and so on and so forth. I'm surprised at the one who makes it to Jannah, how he made it to Jannah. Imam al-Sajjad said to the people, that's what Al-Hasan al-Basri says. What I say, yani what Ahlul Bayt say, I am not surprised at the one who ends up in Jannah, how he ended up in Jannah. I am surprised at the one who ends up into the hellfire, how he ended up into the hellfire. Yani given Allah's mercy, given Allah's compassion, Rahma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We read in Dua Kumail, Allahumma yes aluka bi rahmatika lati wasiat kulla shay. Oh Allah, I ask you through your mercy that has encompassed everything. So Allah is all forgiving, all merciful. Allah loves you, cares about you. He wants you to go to Jannah. So just submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do the basics. Do your salah, do your siyam, do your hajj. Be nice to people. 
have good akhlaq be kind to people be virtuous follow the commands of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and inshallah allah will forgive the rest of the sins that we do don't insist on committing a sin well yani if there's if you listen to haram music try to avoid it stop stop listening to haram music hijab put on your hijab my dear sister may allah bless you inshallah whatever it is that we do try to submit to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you'll see how you will live a life of joy knowing that he is pleased with you subhanahu wa ta'ala so allah is guiding us he wants us to be guided so that to take us to the sarat sarat al aziz al hamid okay now the next ayah allah is the one who has the control of allah is the one who has the control of everything in the heavens and in the earth meaning that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable of rewarding you saving you protecting you it is narrated in a hadith when a person rushes through his salat does not take care of his salat he rushes like some of us do you know they have an appointment we have something to do uh, we want to catch a movie for example so we really pray our salat whatever way and then we go on on our lives when people do this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns to the angels and say this servant of mine does he not know that his affairs are in my hand yani you are rushing through your salat don't you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the control the power you want to make it for for example a meeting well take take your time through the salat and then go to the meeting Allah will facilitate that meeting for you Allah will ease the difficulties for you so try to the best of your ability to take care of your salah take care of your deeds and actions for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the control of everything and this knowledge brings a lot of peace and serenity to the individual brothers and sisters when you know that Allah is in charge of your affairs and Allah loves you then you'll be at peace it is said that there was a lady who had 10 sons. Nine of them got killed with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi in the battles. The last of them, the 10th, he was not so religious. He was like so-so, like some of us. He became ill. His mother was at his you know, bed crying. He says, mother, why are you crying? She said, my son, I lost nine sons. But they died with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, as martyrs, shuhada. I did not cry as much for them because I know that they are probably in the best place in Jannah. They're martyrs with Rasulullah, like, and, you know, basically fighting, defending Islam on the path of Haq. You, however, I'm worried about you. That's why I'm crying. I am worried about you. I'm worried about your akhirah. What's going to happen to you? He said, Mother, who loves me more? You or Allah? She said, Allah loves you more. He says, then do you think he will let me down? If you are worried about me, you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to, you know, who loves me more than you do, he's going to burn me into the hellfire. That's something called husnu vanni billah, having good, positive thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you always be relying on Allah. Of course, not too much. There is, you know, two concepts. There is hope, which is raja, and there is khawf, which is fear. These two need to be equal. Luqman al-Hakim. The wise, Luqman, the wise, tells his son, among the admonishments he gave him, his son, you should have so much hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if you come on the day of judgment bearing the sins of all his creation, you hope that he forgives you. 
at the same time have so much fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if you come to him with all the good deeds of all his creation yet he might still punish you these deeds he may not accept from you uh, these deeds could be there could be some show off in these deeds uh, some things that you did where your niya was not truly purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so one should not have so much hope that he then forgets about the fear and khalas, يعني, Allah will take care of me or whatever happens I don't care يعني, whether I pray I don't pray Allah will take care of me I do haram I who cares if I insult people backbite oh don't worry I'll just pray a couple of rak'at salat and Allah no it doesn't work that way so try to have the balance balance in your life but knowing that Allah is really looking after us then when we experience problems we say inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un surely to Allah we belong and surely to him we shall return Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam says when you say inna lillah you are confessing that you belong to Allah when you say to him we uh, to him we shall return you recognize that you are not going to be lasting in this dunya yani this difficulty this pain that you're experiencing you think it's going to be forever no temporal be patient that's why allah says wa bashir sabirin give good news to those who are patient alladhina idha asabatuhum musiba qalu inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un those when they are when they experience a problem calamity a tragedy they say inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un so do constant dhikr of allah when you have that kind of trust in allah then when you feel down you know like we say we have the blues as they say then you just turn to allah and say ya rabbi help me ya allah support me ya allah help me succeed and you put in your effort and inshallah you'll succeed so that concept of believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is extremely important. It really makes a person feel comfortable. Now, some people will say, Sheikh, I don't feel that comfort. Well, try, try. Keep on trying, you will feel it, inshallah. When you feel difficulties, problems, turn to Allah, say, Ya Rab. It is narrated in the hadith when a mu'min says three times, Ya Rab, yani, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rab, Allah responds, Labbayka abdi. Yes, my servant, what do you want? So Allah will listen to you. Allah is listening to you. Allah is taking care of you. In fact, brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. In the past five years or ten years, how many times Allah has answered your duas? If you remember back five, ten years ago, if you remember a problem that you had five years ago or ten years ago, and you don't have it anymore, it's been resolved for you. Who resolved it for you? Allah did subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you remember that issue, a concern that you had, and now, alhamdulillah, it's been resolved. Most of our du'as are resolved and answered. But we forget, we focus on the one or two du'as that Allah tests us with. And maybe it's for our own benefit. It's like, you know, why this issue, there, Allah, that I want. Otherwise, Allah has given us so many blessings. So many blessings, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So always have good faith in Allah, trust Allah, rely on Him, pray to Him, seek His forgiveness, seek His guidance, and He is there for you. How? Why? Because Allah alladhi lahu ma fis samawati wa ma fil ard. He is the one who has whatever is in the heavens and in the earth. Then, وَوَيْلٌ لِلْكَافِرِينَ مِنْ عَذَابٍ شَدِيدٍ And woe to the disbelievers from a severe punishment. Allah, as I mentioned, loves people. He wants to guide people. But people themselves choose وَالْعِيَاضُ بِاللَّهِ to reject him. This is just to draw an analogy. You have like a father who is successful. Alhamdulillah, he could be uh, very wealthy, very rich. He has a son or a child, son, daughter, who does not study, who does not care. And the father comes and says, son, I am worried about your future. I don't need your education for myself. And Alhamdulillah, I am well off. Everything is okay on my end. I am worried about your future. 
I am worried about what's going to happen to you. So put your mind into it. I will give you whatever you need. You want money? I'll give you money. You want me to support your education? I'll support your education. Whatever tools you want me to hire your tutors, I'll hire your tutors. I'll provide you with every mean that you need to succeed. After all this, the son says, no, I don't care. And what can you do anymore? Unfortunately, some, and, and, and although this is an analogy, but sometimes it's true. Unfortunately, some children, billah, may Allah not give us such children, who no matter how much you admonish them, they, they, they're deaf to your admonishment. Billah. They want to do whatever they want. And some of them, maybe later in life, after 10 years, 20 years, they'll realize. And if you're alive, then they'll come, I'm sorry, father. I'm sorry, mother. But this is after they've ruined their lives. And of course, because they're of us, they're our children, they also hurt us. You know, it hurts us to see them going like on this path where they are going to be, God forbid, destroying themselves and their future. So that's why, listen, to advice, take guidance, my brothers and sisters. This is just as a side note. So some people, well, billah, don't want advice, don't want to listen. But what, what can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? He advises them, he sends them messengers, he sends them guides, he's given them the Quran, but people choose not to listen. And then Allah gives three attributes of these kuffar, of these disbelievers. What are they? First of all, this is ayah number three of Surah Ibrahim. Those who prefer this dunya, the life of this dunya, over the akhirah. Now here, Islam is not a religion that says you can't live in this dunya and, and uh, don't really earn anything. To the contrary. Islam says go work, earn. In fact, we have a hadith from the Prophet that says the best aid to drive people towards God consciousness Piety is wealth, money. Yani with money, for example, you can establish institutions that guide people. With money, for example, you can uh, serve the needs of the people. Some people who might be poor, you help put food on their tables, give them water, access to running water, give them some basic services like health services. Once you've given them their basics, now they can sit and learn. You can actually tell them, now let me educate you. So you need money for all this. And there are some mu'mineen and organizations. May Allah bless them. Allah, you know, sometimes I look at the work, some of these mu'mineen who established some of these organizations to help people in Africa, in India, in Iraq, in Pakistan, in uh, other parts of the world, even in Palestine, Yemen. May Allah bless them. I am really humbled by their efforts. May Allah bless them all what they contribute to the society and, and the world selflessly, really. And some of those individuals, you might know the organization, but you have no idea who's running that organization, who's behind, because they don't want their names to be exposed. Allah gives them tawfiq. Allah gives them tawfiq. And you know what? They will become known. They're, I guarantee you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows the name, brings out the name of the people who work qurbatan ilallahi ta'ala, purely. When they hide their names, they cover their names, Allah brings it out. It is narrated at the time of Imam al-Sajjad, he had a cousin who was a bit, uh, had difficulty in his life in terms of poverty, you know, he did not make his ends meet. So Imam al-Sajjad at night used to cover his face, put a bag on his back and would walk around those people in need and gives them food with his own hand. He used to also come by his, the house of his cousin, knock the door and he would give him food. That cousin would tell him, Oh stranger, may Allah bless you. You remember me every night when my own cousin Ali ibn al Hussein has forgotten about me. Imam al-Sajjad listens to this. You know, like we say sometimes, he puts it into this ear and out into that ear because he's working qurbatan ilallah ta'ala. He doesn't say anything. And the next day he comes back and he gives him again. And every now and then this person complains of Imam al-Sajjad Yet Imam al-Sajjad is seeking his akhirah. Until Imam al-Sajjad died He was martyred and died. 
This person then realized that the one who used to give me the food was Ali ibn al-Hussein. And I used to actually say these things about him. This is the way we should be working. Work for your akhirah. Some people, the problem is they make the dunya their be all and the end all. And that's what Allah is condemning in this ayah. And that's what Ahlul Bayt, for example, condemn when they talk about dunya. You have Imam Ali, alayhi salam, for example, condemning dunya. You read in Dua Abu Hamza Thumali, وَلَا تَجْعَلِ الدُّنْيَا أَكْبَرَ هَمِّنَا oh Allah, do not make uh, dunya, this life, our biggest concern. يعني make the akhirah our biggest concern. My biggest concern should be the akhirah, not dunya. There was a man at the time of Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi salam, Muhammad ibn Umair, ibn Abi Umair. رضوان الله تعالى عليه. He used to be a businessman. Bazaz. He used to sell uh, fabrics. But then Harun, he really put you know a lot of pressure on the Shia. And he used to arrest them and put them in prison and persecute them and execute them. So this man, this man, he was also taken in prison and they threw him into the prison. They took all they took all his assets, all his wealth, everything. Years he was put in prison. After years being put in prison, finally they let him go. He comes out of the prison impoverished. Impoverished, nothing. But خلاص, everything they've taken away from him. He goes and finds a place where he can, you know, settle in. At night, someone knocks his door. He opens the door. A person says, Yabna Abi Umair, here is 10,000 dirhams. 10,000 silver coins. That's a big amount of money. Ibn Abi Umair says, What is this for? He says, You had given me a loan. Back in the good old days, when he was wealthy, you gave me a loan. And then they took you into prison. I never forgot your loan. But I didn't know how to get it to you. You're in the prison. What can I do? Now I hear they released you. So here is the money. Look at the taqwa, subhanAllah. A person would say, oh, jazakallah khair, and he would have taken the money and gone away. But subhanAllah, some people, really they think of their akhirah, not their dunya. Subhanallah. He told him, where did you get this money from? You know, 10,000 dirham is a lot of money. He started probing. Yani, really, put yourself in Muhammad ibn Abi Umair's shoes. You were so wealthy, rich, and then they put you in prison, they take all your assets away, and they free you after several years. Now you come out, nothing. Only with the clothes that are on you, on your back. That's it. That's the only thing you own. يعني you're in desperate need of money. And here is someone, Allah sends him to you that same night when they release you. And he tells you, I borrowed, this is your money. This is your money, take it. SubhanAllah. He told him, where did you get this money from? He said, well, when I heard that you were released, I went and I sold my house. So I got this money from the house that I sold. He said, was this house extra or the house that you were living in? He said, no, this was the house I was living in. Not an extra house. Not like, you know, some investment property I had. No, I sold my house so I could pay off your loan. He said, I hear it from my masters, meaning the Imams, alayhim salam, a hadith. That a house should not be sold to pay off the loans. And this is, of course, there's something important here. Because if you own a house and you sell the house, where are you going to go? Where is your family going to go? At least if you have a house, you know, you're living, your food, inshallah, that will come. And you'll find the rizq, inshallah. That's why it's makruh. We have some ahadith that suggest it's makruh to sell a house to invest in a business because the business might profit or lose. So don't jeopardize your life and the life of your family. What if the business loses? Uh, some people sell the house so that they can, you know, do something with it and then the money after some time disappears. People start spending the money and then خلاص, they end up with no house and no money. That's why it's makruh. Only sell a house to buy another house. 
according to some ahadith. Look, subhanAllah, Ahlul Bayt have really, if you look at their ahadith, they give us some great financial tips. Anyways, going back to this point, he said, I heard from the Ma'sumin alayhim salam that a house should not be sold to pay off debt. So I cannot take this money, take it back. And he did not accept the money, subhanAllah. These are examples of people who don't make the dunya their biggest concern. The kuffar, however, no. Dunya, khalas. They are ready to burn the world if necessary, just for their dunya. People sometimes, because I want to become the president of this organization, he insults this man, he really insults that man, he harasses the religion itself, billah, just to keep his name, that I am in charge, I am in power. That's not the way to go. I know you want to do khidmah, but do khidmah qurbatan ila Allah ta'ala, not to abuse power. So some people, والعياذ billah, they love dunya. They think that they're going to be living in this dunya forever. So that's the first problem. Second problem. وَيَصُدُّونَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ They stop people from preaching about the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yani some people, okay, you don't want to be guided. At least let others be guided. No. I don't want to be guided. You as well. No. I don't want anyone to be guided. I heard sometimes from some of the ulama, the speakers actually. They told me. They said we were at an area, one of those speakers interestingly. He says I was in a, at an area where people who used to come to the masjid, some of them would have bars والعياذ billah. You know, they would serve alcohol. So he got up. And he told them, this is haram. You cannot sell alcohol and khamr and when I have dancing and all. What is this haram? He said, they came to me after some time. They said, listen, Sheikh. You just speak about Allah. Speak about salat, siyam. These matters of business, halal, haram. Don't talk about them. Don't talk about them. He says, what do you mean I don't talk about them? So they said, you know, if you want to keep your business, your life, livelihood here, you want to stay as a Sheikh? Then don't talk about these things. He said, forget it. So they kicked him out. Subhanallah. Because they wanted to serve alcohol. And although, you know, you, you, you might be laughing now. But sometimes, same thing happens. They come to a sheikh, don't talk about hijab. You know, and then because he talks about hijab, they kick him out. Uh, or a sheikh that talks about, for example, someone who talks about like halal and haram. Like, you know, you can't run, be running an organization that you call a Isla so-called Islamic organization and have so much, so many things that are of Allah's disobedience happening in here. But no, don't say that because people will get unhappy. Who do you want to please, Allah or the people? You know, then why do we remember Amir al-Mu'mineen, sallallahu alayhi They came to Imam Ali, alayhi salam. They told him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, when he first took the Khilafah, he said, keep Muawiyah now in his position. Give some power to Talha, Zubair, uh, so that you keep everyone happy until you get the power, to get the strength, and then just get rid of them all. Get rid of, get rid of them all. He said to him, and what will I answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What am I going to answer Allah? So why did Imam Ali go through three major wars during his lifetime? The Battle of the Camel, and the Battle of Safin, and the Battle of Al-Nahrawan. Because there is no compromise when it comes to Haqq. Some people don't want. Khalas. So we should do it. And then not only do they not want people to preach about the truth. No, they want to deviate others. So first of all, they love this dunya. They prefer it over the akhirah. Second, they stop. They stop people from preaching about the path of Allah. And the third is they want others to deviate. Yani not only I go to Jahannam, I want others to come with me to Jahannam as well. That's why Quran says in Surah Al-Furqan, on the day when the tyrant, Zalim, the oppressors, will bite on his hand. You know, sometimes people bite on their fingers when they really like, oh, you know, Allah saying they will bite on their hand, not just their finger. He says, I wish I had followed the path of the messenger. I wish I did not follow so-and-so, Fulan and Khalila, as a friend. I hope I did not take him. He comes to you as a friend. 
he is deviating he for example takes the drugs he tells you go take drugs they make you feel really good they help you concentrate and well billah they get people into drugs addiction which is a huge problem that us facing this marijuana for example it might be legal in some countries but it is haram it intoxicates alcohol some people want to take other people with them to parties and dancing and deviate them from the path of haq billah. one has to be careful one has to be careful so not only do some people deviate they want to deviate others look at for example you know Fir'aun Fir'aun not only did he want Musa to stop preaching he wanted to deviate people as well I am your Lord and worship me when people believe like the magicians he punished them and persecuted them and killed them and that's you know an example Allah gives across history across history until this day and age we have a Fir'aun in fact if then we had, there was one Fir'aun today you'll have many Fara'in fara many Fara'ina many Fir'auns so people need to be careful okay and then those are in great misguidance the next ayah and we'll finish insha'Allah and we did not send any messenger but with the tongue of his community so that he can describe to them he can explain things to them the tongue here of course speaking their language is important but the language is not just a language it's also the culture yani for example the prophet is of the arabs so he understands their mentality he knows how to preach to them he can speak to them in a language they understand. For example, one day a man came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He said, Ya Rasulullah, you look at me. See, for example, I am brown. You know, I am dark skinned. My wife, she is darker than me in her skin. And she brought me a son. You know, she delivered a son who's red. Red meaning it's like he's a bit like, you know, uh, semi, semi blonde, if we may call him. Semi blonde. How is that? This is not my son. So he was accusing his wife billah, of committing adultery. Because I am dark. Look at my skin. My wife's skin is darker than I am. But my son is different color. Now, how do you explain this to him? You know, back in those days, people didn't understand genetics and so on and so forth. And you're carrying certain genes and there are recessive genes and dominant genes and all that stuff. You know, that's not easy to explain to this man. But the Prophet knows the culture he knows the mentality of the people so he turned to him he said uh, do you raise camels you have camels?" he said yes I, that's what I do for a living I have camels and I raise camels he said have you ever had for example a, a brown camel with a brown camel and they give birth to a red camel he said yes I've seen that happen he said the same thing happened to you here this is your son so go back and he, see, he understood his mentality camels so he gave him an example from the, the the life of the people so he understands the culture that's why this language is not just a language it, it really opens doors to culture and people understand the culture so that's really important okay now why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send the messengers to guide people Allah says in surah al-hadid that he sent the messengers and delivered down the books with them the scriptures so that people can establish justice قسط. قسط. الناس بالقسط. so that people can justice is important justice means the way really if you look at the essence of the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's about your relationship to your Lord your relationship to the other human being your fellow human being and your relationship to yourself you should not oppress yourself you should not oppress your fellow human being and you should purify that relationship between you and your Lord you should submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that's the essence of religion really the essence of it is this if you really break it down so Allah sent the messengers so that they can establish this justice so that you are fair to yourself you are fair to the people you are fair to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Amir al-Mu'mini goes to visit one of uh, his companions Ibn Ziyad not Ubaidullah Ibn Ziyad some other man Ibn Ziyad 
uh, and he finds him in a very big house and he tells him you really should have thought of your house in the akhirah not in dunya but you can make this house as a means of building a big house in the akhirah by uh, taking care of the guests so when guests come in you host them hosting guests has a lot of thawab lots of ajr especially if they're mu'mineen second taking care of your kin third giving the hukuk if there are any rights obligations duties that you need to pay off for example your homes uh, you have some zakat pay off and then this way you are making this house as a means of building a house in the akhara he told him then my ya amir al-mu'mineen can you speak to my brother please he said what's the matter with your brother he says my brother he's deserted his wife and his children and he's gone to live in a desert because he wants to uh, detach himself from this dunya so he says call him he called him over he said ya adiya nafsik this is all in nahj al-balagha by the way yeah. asam ibn ziyad asam ibn ziyad he told him ya adiya nafsik he says oh one who's enemy to yourself and you're not being fair to yourself you're oppressing yourself you're not being fair to yourself what have you done why do you allow shaitan to fool you and take you away from your family and everything so he looked at Imam Ali and said, Ya Amir al-Mumineen, look at you. Look at your life. You wear, look what, what you're wearing. Look at your, your life and so on. So he says, don't compare yourself to me. I am the Imam of the Ummah. I am the Khalifa. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the Imam of the Ummah, the leader of the Ummah, to be among the average of the people. I'm paraphrasing the words of Amir al-Mumineen, salam Allah Ali, of course. This is the essence of what he said. He said he wanted so that the poor person would not feel... Uh, his poverty like you know he thinks like look at these leadership people in the leadership they're living in these palaces mansions they're billionaires and we can barely make our ends meet it makes them really feel down it uh, they sometimes revolt because of this oppression so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the leadership to really share the pain so don't compare yourself to me I am an imam I am the khalifa you يعني, meaning that have Justice, be fair to yourself and to others. Also in Nahjul Balagha, Imam Amir al muminin mentions five reasons why Allah sends the messengers. In the first khutbah, he says, لِيَسْتَأْدُوهُمْ فطرته, He sent all the messengers and provided prophets at different time intervals so that they can give the covenant that they gave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this could be in reference to verse 172 of Surah Al-A'raf where Allah says, And when your Lord took from the children of Adam of their loins, their progeny, and he made them testify upon themselves, am I not your Lord? They said, yes, we testify. So that you don't say on the day of judgment, we were not aware of this. How did Allah take this covenant? How was this done? That's not the topic of our discussion tonight. If you refer to a book called Sharh Nahj al Balagha, the interpretation of Nahj al Balagha by Sayyid Habib Allah al Khoi, Minhaj al Bara'a, fi Sharh Nahj al Balagha, when he answers and interprets this uh, part of the khutbah, the first khutbah of Nahj al Balagha, he gives several ahadith about how this happens. Then he comes to the conclusion that he says, so the conclusion of all these ahadith and everything is that Allah made the humanity, human beings, testify of his lordship, of the message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, and the wilaya to Amir al muminin and the imams alayhi salam. Meaning people took covenant to Allah to believe in him, in his message, and in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, and the imams alayhi salam. And this is really the instinct that if a person really feels desperate in the deep, in the bottom of his heart, he will turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so the first reason is to take this covenant from the people. And remind them of the blessings that he has bestowed upon them that they've forgotten. Yani Allah gave you this air to breathe. Allah has given you all these blessings. Shouldn't you worship him? If a person comes to you during this COVID-19 pandemic and you've lost your job, let's say, and, and you can't pay off your mortgage and your children are starving, for example, God forbid, someone comes, he says, I'll pay off your mortgage in the meantime. I will give you money to look after your children. So don't feel concerned. 
how much would you be indebted to this individual what about Allah who's given you life altogether and he show gratitude so you that kill home and see any third to you had bit tabligh so that they would uh, give them no excuse on the day of judgment to argue against Allah. Say, Allah, had you sent us messengers, we would have been believed. Why didn't you send us messengers? Allah says, hey, I'm sending you messengers. So to do hujjah, to give the proof against them so that they don't have an excuse on the day of judgment. Fourth, and they provoke their intellect for them. They really show them, uh, allow them to use reason, the intellect to progress, to develop. We have actually... Uh, uh, some scholars who say the essence and the foundation of all knowledge stems from the prophets. Idris, for example, the prophet was the first to write. He taught people to write. He also taught people to stitch and so on and so forth. Our prophet ﷺ taught people to read and to think. Otherwise, the Arabs were living as nomads until Rasulullah ﷺ comes. And then all of a the sudden they started becoming intellectuals, philosophers, uh, and they governed two-thirds of this world. For 700 years, they produced so much knowledge. Where were they before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? You know, that's... يُثِيرُ لَهُمْ دَفَائِنَ الْعُقُولِ And to show, him, to show them his signs. How the skies are elevated above, above them, how the earth is underneath them. So these are five reasons so that people can turn to Allah, be guided to Allah, be shown Allah's mercy. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends people, messengers, with the tongue of their people, Allah then guides whomever he wills and misguides whomever he wills. This does not take free will away from people. It's those who choose to be guided. Like I said, Allah loves people. He wants to guide them. But some people choose. They don't want to follow Allah's command. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it comes to the religion of Allah, he does not make people choose. Allah did not choose. let people choose which month in the year do you want to fast. He said, you fast month of Ramadan. Allah did not people people choose who do you want as a prophet? You know, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi Rasulullah. Muhammad Rasulullah. Khalas, he's the prophet of God. So in certain matters, Allah does not give people choice. In matters of creation, did you choose your parents? Did you choose your siblings? Did you choose where you were born? He's khalas, you can't choose. Can you choose to change the sun and the moon and their distance from the earth, for example? These are matters of creation, creative will. That you cannot change. You do have no choice. But in legislation, Sharia, يعني meaning do you uh, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do you uh, pray salat? Do you, uh, that up to you. Allah showing you the path and you choose. So when it comes to creation and when it comes to the religion of Allah, Allah does not give choice to people. But when it comes to obeying the religion, following the commands of Allah, the legislation of Allah, that you have a choice and that's what he will punish you or reward you for on the day of judgment. So people choose to obey him or disobey him. And finally, وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ And he is almighty and wise. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us inshallah to the surat al-mustaqeem. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who understand the essence of his message and submit to him and follow the path of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Raise your hands in the dua. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amman yujibu al-muzdarra idha da'ahu wa yakshifu al-suh. 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 اللهم اكشف عنا السوء يا الله اللهم اغفر ذنوبنا كفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار اللهم اجعلنا مع محمد وال محمد واهدنا على هداهم وأحينا حياتهم وأمتنا مماتهم وحشرنا في زمرتهم وارزقنا شفاعتهم اللهم اقض حوائج المؤمنين والمؤمنات شاف وعاف جميع مرضى المؤمنين والمؤمنات اللهم رب اغفر لي ولوالدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب رب ارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا اجزهما بالإحسان إحسانا وبالسيئات غفرانا رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج 
واجعلنا من شيعته وأنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم كن لوليك حجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين لقضاء الحوائج ولشفاء المرضى ولكشف هذه الغم عن هذه الأمة ولتعجيل فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان وإلى روح أمواتنا وأموات المؤمنين والمؤمنات والشهداء والعلماء رحم الله من يقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته